<laughs> Not quite back with a win, but we're still unbeaten. Yes, people, I will welcome back to another tactical analysis of my good friend Rami from the Stats Optic. As always, all his links will be left in the description. Today, we are analysing Arsenal 2, Tottenham 2. A tactical masterclass, or in many respects, a disaster class for Arteta on this occasion. So let's get straight into it. So talk me through the match report, Rami, as we always start with. Yeah, I mean, usually we're here seeing dominant displays, seeing Arsenal control every aspect of the game, but it feels like today was a bit of a different one. We didn't really exert our control in the match. We allowed too much transitional play. And when you have transitional play, you have a lot of space to play with. And just like the PSV game, a lot of 1v1s, a lot of, you know, attacking scenarios. And here we have Spurs dominating, I mean, shots from open play. We didn't capitalise more on the controlling aspect of the match, so we didn't allow ourselves to really create enough quick passes, enough, you know, movements, higher, you know, higher line. I didn't really see ourselves with a lot of, you know, in in behind movement. So it was really a different type of game today. So I think the match report really reflects that. Yeah, no, I agree with you in every respect. I think going into this game, I definitely thought we'd have too much for Tottenham. I thought this was going to be a clear Arsenal win, right? And I did not expect this to be fair. Like Spurs on the balance of play, they had more possession than us. It doesn't show here, but they had more possession yeah, yeah. than us. Shots was pretty much identical. They had more yep. shots from open play. Spurs, mm. if anything, I'm not going to go as far as saying they outplayed us because that's too much. It wasn't night and day. But they, I think they were well worth... If any team deserved to win, I, I personally think Spurs probably deserve the three points over Arsenal in terms of their ambition, especially in that second half. We could not get near them. Obviously, the injuries were part of that. And the online serving the game. But definitely some parts of the games there where I'm thinking, that's not a typical Arsenal performance. Definitely that I've seen under Arteta recently. We are far off it, to be completely honest. Yeah. So let's, let's move on to our... Um, to our attacking threats, right? We normally do this. And against PSV, it was fantastic. It was basically even across the lines. Yeah. Today, against Tottenham Hotspur, as you can see, both Arsenal and Tottenham attacking down the same side. Arsenal's left, Tottenham's right. That surprises me because given that Gabriel Jesus was playing at left wing, not a Martinelli or a Trossard, I would have assumed Arsenal would have more attacks down the right-hand side. You couple yeah. up with that with the fact that Destiny Udogi got a yellow card after about 15 minutes. We should have been yeah. going straight at that right-hand side every, literally pretty much every single attack to isolate that man against Saka. But he got yellow card, then we just kind of left him alone. We let him off the hook. What's your thoughts on it? Yeah, I mean, I feel like the game really developed in a in a weird way where I don't think we really capitalised on moments like that, especially in the derby, when the crowd are really up for it. And mm. when someone gets yellow card, you really want to be up against them 1v1. So I think really what happened was Erdegaard was really marked out the game. And I think yeah. his performance was really nullified. Because he really wanted to be higher up the pitch, but he didn't have any play, you know, any chance to really get in those spaces and really take the ball, pick it up and drive. So I really did feel like his combination with Saka today wasn't as good as it would have normally been. So I feel like we really then ended up seeing, okay, when the play on the right is a bit, you know, marked, it's a bit, you know, one sided, we just switch the play and play it into feet with Jesus. Again, it is a threat. But at the same time, you want to keep using both balanced sides and you want to keep using both mm. sides you know, to exploit, you know, create chances. But yeah, I don't think we really saw that today. No, I agree. And if you look at Tottenham, 50% of their attacks on average come down the right-hand side. And it got to a position in the game, right, where about 35 minutes in, Arsenal looking comfortable. We'd got our first goal. We came mightily close with Gabriel Jesus' howler of a miss. And I'm thinking, you know what? We're looking good. We're building into the game. But suddenly Spurs, from passing out the back, found that little outlet ball, which was over the back of Zinchenko to Kulisevsky on the right-hand side. And that's yeah. where they thought they were in money. And they got a, they got their goal from that direction as well. Obviously, it developed over to the left-hand side, but initially came from a, a cross from the right, which Raya tipped back into play. So that's where Tottenham really found their joy, but in behind Zinchenko. And look, we've spoken about how City obviously let go of Cancelo, etc., let go of Zinchenko themselves because they wanted a, four, a back four that is solid defensively. Zinchenko, once again, I don't think he was at fault for the goals. Don't make any mistake about it. But mm. you saw from here, Tottenham identified Arsenal's weakness, which was Zinchenko as a left-back, and tried to exploit it. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, I think they really transitioned City, you're talking about. They really transitioned to four people, four defenders that can defend. I think we spoke about this before. Mm. And what it really does is it doesn't allow for many turnovers, you know. <laughs> you're going to have four solid defenders. You're going to clear the ball. You're going to get the ball back pretty easily. There's not enough space for them to take. But yeah, I don't know. I think Zinchenko for me is a really special technical football player. I think mm. him as you know, you know, 
quarter feet passing is great and i think i had a really great, like, crazy you know moment where i really say that zinchenko should be an eight and he should be yeah. and what he does for ukraine is play higher higher up as an eight and i would rather him play for us in the eight <laughs> as mad as that is and i would rather My timber uh, in the left back and have you know zinchenko play maybe in the Havertz role for example or maybe in the early god role as I'm maybe option maybe 100%. I was thinking the same thing. If Timber was fit, I genuinely think Arteta would have oh, experimented yeah. at one point with Zinchenko at the eight and Timber at left back. Because, mm-hmm. I mean, before the game, I saw the interviews for, with both managers. Ange Postacoglu kept it simple. He says, they, 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 they asked him, how are you going to win this game? He said, very simply, he goes, we, we exploit their weaknesses. They try not to exploit ours. And Tottenham found Arsenal's weakness. They found our soft belly, which was down the right-hand side. That's where the majority of their attacks were taking place. And it's just one of those things, man. It, it happens. Now let's move on to the, the attacks from both sides. So as you can see with Arsenal, pretty balanced threat approach it looks like. Spurs, the majority of possession in their own half. I think, to be fair, the first 30 minutes of that game was very similar to how we played Manchester United, where Spurs looked very comfortable in possession. Their keeper was getting a lot of touches on the ball. The defence was having a lot of touches on the ball. But it really looked threatening. They looked comfortable, but not threatening. And is that the new thing, the way to play Arsenal? Because made a mistake about it. I thought we were much better against Manchester United. But again, against them, it took us to the 96 minutes to find a winner. In both games against Manchester United and Tottenham, we're playing against teams that are comfortable on the ball, not really going forward with it, but being comfortable in their own half. But that's frustrating us, as we haven't, haven't had enough of the ball possession to win the game. What's your thoughts in that respect? Yeah, I think I totally agree. I think teams right now have seen that they are comfortable with just sitting back. Mm. And who are strong also in just counter-attacking. But not, again, not counter-attacking four pitches, but able to retain possession of the ball when we lose the ball. So especially when we lost the ball in our own half, we lacked the ability to win it back. And that was because the play was really expansive. You know, possibly when we're lining up in a 4-2-3-1, it's, it's not something that is really easy to break down as soon as you lose the ball. And especially we didn't really retain high, a high, high line all game it felt like we didn't exert our control and maybe that's down to personnel i feel like it is down to personnel um we had a few obviously trussard out maybe in Ketty's involvement as well may not have been as what we would have wanted again in the game i feel like we needed somebody who's again the jesus down the middle across all you know across the three being able to link up, we lack that ability. And that really is really, really key to retain control. But I did feel like, again, in the first half, we should have sealed the game. Yeah. <laughs> as, as insane as that is, we should have won the game in the first half because we had chances to press them and we won the press. And, you know, there, how many chances did we have? We had the Inketia chance and we had the Jesus chance on top of the Saka goal. So these two other opportunities really should have been buried away. And a more clinical side, you know, would have done that. 100% agree with you. And I feel like there's a new way to play the Arsenals of the world. I think against Man City, it's very tough to win that game no matter how well you play them. You could have a 10 out of 10 performance and you could still lose that game if Man City are yeah. eight, and 8 out of 10 or above. But against Arsenal, because we're not quite at Man City's level, I think there's a way to play us. And I think I would coin this term possession, or well, defensive possession, or what's yeah. it like that style of football, where you just hold the ball you don't really go anywhere with it, but you just hold the ball and pass around the back so you're comfortable with it. Because there were so many times where Spurs, in the first half, we looked like we were, we were picking them up on the on the press. But in that second yeah. half, they were picking us apart with the passes, man. They weren't really doing anything crazy. I don't think Spurs come away with that game thinking, oh my God, we should have scored four or five goals today. They scored two, and if it wasn't for a David Ryan escape, they maybe, they maybe would have got a third one. But other than that, they didn't really look like they were going to score another goal. But what they did have was a lot of possession. And at the end of the day, right, I know it's cliche, I know it's simple, but if you have the ball, the other team cannot score at the end of the day. So would, if you're playing against Arsenal team that's got 46% possession versus an Arsenal team that has 75% possession, you're more likely going to beat them if they have 46% of the ball because they're not having the ball as much. So we've seen United do it, we've seen Tottenham do it. Maybe that's a new way. In the olden days, teams would come, whenever, whenever they play Arsenal, right, they get the ball back, they just boot it up the pitch play long ball up to their striker, but more often than not, Arsenal would win it and and they go for another attack, waves and waves of attack. Now it's win the ball back off Arsenal and just pass it round the back. Don't really do anything with it, but just keep the ball for a bit. I think that's a new way to play Arsenal. Let's see how other teams approach it as well in that respect. Uh, So yeah, let's move on to the XG. So this is interesting. I I did not uh, see the XG obviously before starting this video and it's the first time I'm seeing it. Arsenal with 2.03, Spurs with 1.46. Now as a caveat, 
I'm not. Mis- I, I don't think I'm mistaken when I say this, right? And by the way, the Arsenal is on the right hand side. The Spurs one's on the left hand side. Uh, to make that clear to everyone, I think the penalty probably does shift it a lot because penalties naturally have a very high XG. Um, yeah. But after that, that really does surprise me. So on on XG terms, Arsenal probably deserve to win this game. Which, but I don't know how how much would you would you factor in XG? Uh, in terms of this game, it was it was tough. I think we created a lot of chances, but it felt like in the second half towards the latter end of the game is when the chances started to come on. You know, when Smith Rowe came on, when Reese Nelson came on, and I was I was screaming for Reese Nelson to come on. I think I really, really want, I think all, all fans wanted, he's just down the middle and Reese Nelson out left. Yeah. And those type of chances really, we didn't really materialise a lot of our chances. You know, we had those, again, the Nketiah and the Jesus, those two chances for me should have been a goal. And, yeah. That Inketia chance, I look at it and I say he tried to go near post, mm. but really and truly higher, higher up. Those type of chances, you want to just you know, net it as high as possible, where the keeper's already low. You want to get it high. Again, Jesus should be tucking that away. A more clinical striker does that. You know, Ivan Tony, a Haaland, a Harry Kane, these type mm. of strikers, those type of profiles do that. And I think we really need to phase away from these type of big chances missed strikers that create a lot but don't finish because in moments like this is when you need that. I 100% agree with you. And there's, there's two points off the back of that. The one thing you said about high and near post is 100% true. I actually watched a video from Mikel Arteta where he said, he tells his strikers and his wingers, when you, whenever you shoot near post, you go high. Whenever you shoot yeah. far post, you go low. Yeah. He said that case in point. So the fact that Nketi is going low and near post it's, it's completely yeah. beyond me, to be honest. And another point I'm going to make, someone on the AFTV said this when I watched the interviews, I can't remember who, and it was actually made perfect sense. He said, Ars- right now we have strikers, but we don't have goal scorers. Yeah. And that's so true if you think about it. We've got strikers, Jesus and Nketi, they're strikers, but they're not goal scorers in that respect. They don't, you can't bank them and score 20 goals a season. I made this point in my videos the other day, right? Saying, tell me a team that's won the Premier League and they've not had a goal scorer that scores 20 plus goals. It doesn't yeah. really happen. It doesn't have to be the striker. The Liverpool won the league with Salah getting the 30 plus goals a season. But you need to win the league with a with a player scoring at least 20 goals. And no one at Arsenal right now has scored 20 plus goals a season. Yeah. Zach is capable. Martin yeah. on his on his day could be capable. He's not scored any goals so far this season. Mm-hmm. Do you bank on Jesus and Ketty getting 20 goals? I personally don't. So no. No. I agree with 100 percent The Ivan Tony player would be absolutely perfect. And look, we heard rumors today from Fabrizio Romano that he's yeah. requesting a transfer away. I mean, he's already said that he likes Arsenal's style. Hopefully, yeah. it's one we go for. Yeah. Okay, so talk me through this, uh, Rami. The both teams in central areas get shots off. Yeah, I mean, we know that both threats from both teams really are down the wings. You know, even with Son playing up front, um, mm. most of their opportunities come down. You know, overlaps. You know, Kulisevsky overlapping Pedro Porro. But again, it really comes down to this game was a transition game. A lot of chances came off the bat of poor passes, you know, poor, not enough, you know, pass sequences, not enough, you know, good quality threading balls, just poor quality overall. <laughs> and that's what happened. This is what happens when, it, you know, when poor quality occurs is you get transitional play and bam, shots down the middle really, really, you know, happened quite a lot for us. And, you know, both sides, both teams it sort of mirrored mirrored approaches and I don't think we did enough to create good enough chances overall throughout the 90. I think I we only had moments but we had a lot of time when we didn't create good chances because we didn't retain possession. We weren't like the Everton game which I go back to where it was we knew a chance was going to come because we kept yeah. recycling play and we kept you know first half was slower second half was quicker but here it was I was seeing passes Poor passes going out left, right, and central. And I'm thinking, this is a big game. <laughs> was it nerves? You know, we saw Saliba in the first like 20, 30 minutes, who for me was one of the better players, but you know, misplacing passes. At the start of a match, you really want to string good, you know, sequences together because it creates tempo and it gets the crowd uplifted, it creates confidence within the team. And yeah, poor start and poor finish really for me. No, spot on. 100 percent agree with you in that respect as well. And it did seem that way, especially in the second half, right? What did we really do in that second half? We had a flurry after about two, three minutes, which resulted in a penalty after about 52 minutes. Yeah. After the penalty, did we even have a shot? I, I genuinely can't remember us even having a shot. And you're right, in the Man United and Everton game, although a goal didn't come, the winner didn't come until in the in the latter quarter of the match, 
we looked dangerous the whole match. Like it was building to a crescendo. Do you get what I mean? If it was yeah, like yeah. classical music, yeah. it's building to that like moment where everyone knows it's coming. Whereas in this game, it just felt a little bit discombobulated. It felt like, oh, is it building? No, it's not. It's like it felt a bit hit and miss. It felt like if it was gonna come, it would have yeah. just come by luck or by anything. Like it could have exactly. been the death of your doggy, last second penalty, it coming off his hand, and you would have sat there and gone, right, we bust case, we got away with one there. It didn't really look like it was structured or planned. And that's the worrying thing for me. So I 100% agree with you in that respect. Now let's look at the average player positions for both teams. And this is what I wanted to look at in particular. Because I made a point on my on my live stream after the game that with Jesus at left wing, I thought it was a criminal mistake by Mikel Arteta. I agree with you. I was calling for Reese Nelson to come on the pitch, but I was definitely asking for him to start, to be honest. Once I found out Trussell was injured, in fact, you told me Trussell was injured when you messaged me. Yeah. I was immediately thinking, right, we're going to have to have a wing on that pitch. I knew yeah. I had to put Jesus at left wing. And yeah. I knew also, to be fair, that this is not what Arteta wanted because he did not play NKT at all during midweek at PSV. The fact he didn't even come off the bench led me to believe that he won't be playing in the North London derby or at least starting in that respect. So with Jesus on the pitch, the problem was, right, I don't know about you, but for me, he tucks in too much. It's not his fault. He's he, he, he's a striker by trade that's playing left wing. He wants to come close to Enketia. The problem is, the reason that it works with Trossard or Martelli on the wing is because they keep their width. You know, the tenets of football, you attack wide, you defend narrow. It's mm. the tenets of football, man. Space the pitch. Yeah. As you said, Erdogan was marked out of the game. Why was he marked out of the game? Because Jesus was coming inside and playing next to Enketia. Pedro yeah. Borg could tuck in. Christian Romero could tuck in. The, the, the uh, back four came tight. Saar and Basuma could basically hold hands in midfield. And they could lock up Vieira, Erdogan and Gabriel Jesus all mm. amongst them. If Gabriel yeah. Jesus kept his whip, which I would personally side Reese Nelson because at least he would have kept his whip. Pedro Porro is forced to go out there. Then it stretches yeah. the back four. And then it, you create a really open, expansive game, just like against PSV. And I think that's what we would have done. All the pundits during the week, Paul Merson included, said if it becomes an open and expansive game, Arsenal will take Spurs to the cleaners. And I thoroughly agree with that. If Trossard played today, I think we win the game. If Martin yeah. played today, I think we win the game. We made it into a tighter contest and made it into a bit of a battle. And I think that's what suited Spurs. Do you agree with that respect? No, bang on. It was, it's exactly what it is. You know, we, if we're not opening up the pitch for us to play, we saw it in the first half. It was it, Fabio Vieira had not a sniff on the ball. Mm. It was Fabio Vieira from last season. It's yeah. any touch, no space. You know, he was marked out the whole game and it is very, very tough for him to operate. And it wasn't his fault because it was really... The front three dictate the game. As funny as that is, the front three dictate the game, especially for our style. When the front three set the tempo, it affects the rest of the team. It is a, you know, a chain effect. And Jesus tucking in, like you're saying, it doesn't allow for Fabio Vieira to really operate, get any good touches in, which is why he has come off. And I felt like when Jesus came off and we had Havertz, Reese Nelson, and Katia up front, I did feel like we were more threatening than we were when we started the game because mm. it was Reese Nelson really coming out wide and him being able to, you know, link play, especially as well when uh, Reece Nel uh, sorry, when Emil Smith Rowe came on as well. We really had a lot of space to operate and we were then able to create good passing, like passing sequences. And that really allowed us to retain pressure because we retained pressure quite well in the last 10 minutes of the game when it was 90 plus 10 added on. I think we had a lot of threat going forward. I just didn't see us scoring a goal because you know, our shooting boots weren't warm the whole game. But uh, yeah, no, I totally agree. And I think, I think I'm, I'm hoping that next, you know, next week when when the players are fit, maybe even for the Bremen game, that we go for a, a side that is suited to more what Mikel Arteta does and not you know scraping just for personnel. 100% agree with you. And by contrast, I'm gonna make a quick point. Look at Tottenham, for example. Look at seven, twenty-one, ten, and twenty-two. Yeah. Brendan Johnson, Kulisevsky, Son, and then James Madison. That right there, if you look at their average positions, would be how you would line up a team. Yeah. If you're looking at a formation to start the game, that would be it. Would you look at Arsenal right there, yeah? And I understand that. Mikel Arteta talks about or whatever, 50, 60 different formations during a game, right? If you look at the two teams there, who looks more organised? Yes, fair enough, you can see Tottenham's midfield looks a little bit disjointed, but their front four, if you include Madison, looks bang on what you'd expect in terms of average positions. Bang on. Yeah. Was yeah. you know, awesome. you see, Nketi is quite deep. You look at Jesus mm -hmm. basically next to him. Then there's a massive gap to Erdogan and Saka who are basically holding hands. It didn't really, the whole match didn't feel like it was in rhythm or connected. I spoke about Arsenal during the PSV and Everton game, being like synchronised swimmers on this tactical analysis. But we were nothing like that today. We were unsynchronised swimmers, if, if that's even a thing. Yeah. And it was a bunch of individuals yeah. just running around the football pitch, it felt like. Yeah. 
So now let's get into the actual gameplay analysis. So this is one of the early chances we had. I think one of the first chances we had, actually. Saka whipping in back post and Jesus coming across the corner. A fantastic save by Vicario. So tell yeah. me what you're uh, thinking about here, the Saka versus Udogi situation. Yeah, we touched on this before. Again, those situations occurred quite a lot in the first half, less so in the second half. It was something that we had a lot of space in transition. When we were able to you know, thread a couple of passes through, we had a lot of space and, you know, Saka was able to get in, cut in and cross the ball. And again, this is what happened for the first goal really is the space that was allowed for Saka in that goal. And yeah, I mean, look, the cross was good. The save was a great save. You cannot, you know, fault that, you know, Jesus did what Jesus could do in a scenario like that. But again, situations like that occurring, that was our only threat. <laughs> it felt like all game is the Saka Udogi situations all game. And I yeah. felt like that was the problem. We have a lot of quality players. We didn't utilise them. I still don't get it because you, you hit the nail on the head. It was Saka versus Udogi. When I did the preview on my channel, I said the wingers is going to be the part that defines mm. this game. I predicted 3-2 because I knew there'd be goals. But I thought yeah. we just have a bit too much quality against Tottenham. Mm. And we got Udogi yellow card after 15 minutes. And we just didn't attack him again. Yeah. Made no sense. Saka was one-on-one -on -one against him multiple times. Spurs were letting... I was playing one-on-one against a doggy. Maybe he just felt he couldn't beat him for pace. I don't know, but he should have done much more in those situations. Now let's talk about their goals. So Saka obviously comes into the area. This was a bit of a mess up between Brennan Johnson and your doggy, who both went <laughs> outside when Saka cut inside. This, to be fair, was, I think, Saka obviously aiming for goal. He got in the way, Christian Romero. Do you blame Romero in this situation? Do you think that his body position was wrong? Or do you think he just had to stick out a leg and it's just one of those things? I think just miscommunication. I think if the keeper knows that he's going to get that screaming guy to his box, <laughs> knowing that he's going to get it, I think mm. it's just a poor, poor mistake. I don't think you really see it often from Romero as well. He's a quality player as it is. But um, yeah, I think it's great from Ben White. I think Ben White really makes this move possible. Yeah. And he makes this goal possible. It's exactly what you're saying. Yeah, they're confused. They don't know. They didn't make this mistake again. <laughs> they were really well communicated, Brennan Johnson and Adogi after that. But you could just tell, you know, this type of quality is what we needed. And I feel like if we had Martinelli, if we had that threat from in behind, we'd offer something a bit more different yeah. against, you know, Pedro Porro, who really just looked like he that angle himself waiting for the cutting on the inside to happen when Martinelli offers both threats. So, yeah, I hope that we, you know, I wish we had this you know, ability to choose which sides we could go, but it didn't allow it today for injury purposes. No. Yeah, no, 100% agree with you. And, and the point there as well you made about Pedro Porro is a fantastic point. I don't really remember Pedro Porro defending today, really. I remember him going forward and whipping in crosses, but I don't really remember him defending. And that's really got to be worrying signs. When you're at home at the Emirates, and I make this point about being, for me, draws at home when you're a top team like Arsenal, Man City, etc. Draws yeah. at home feel like losses. I don't care if you're playing a Tottenham or you're playing a, a Luton Town. A draw at home feels like a loss for me. So if you look at the balance of the game, yes, potentially a draw was a fair result. The most, most Arsenal could have hoped for. But it still feels like a loss in that respect. And it's, it's little moments like this, man, because you take, you get a goal from a bit of luck, fine. But how many times do we see luck go for Man City, for Man United, for Chelsea? It happens, man. Luck, luck happens. You then got to use that to your advantage. You don't just throw it away. And that, mm -hmm. that was a real shame. So let's look at the press. So this is the chance, I believe, that Jesus had, right? Yeah, exactly. This is it. Yeah, this is it. So, again, I said that, and I, I remember messages in the group chat is, they're there for the taking. When it comes yeah. to their press, they're not, look, six games in, they're not well-oiled. They're not as if we were when we were coming up from the press. We're looking a bit comfortable, okay, again. Sometimes we're playing a risky pass here and there, but we are very well-oiled as a team. We're well, you know, worked. We've done this a billion times in training. All these players have played together with each other. We're easier, it's easier for us to play at the back. This is a team that is personnel, two, three players have just come in from the summer transfer window. We should be all over them in the high press. We should be, you know, compact. The spaces between the lines should be very minimal. We should be saying, come long. We can take it with Gabriel or Saliba or come short. We should be able to press them man for man. But we didn't. And this opportunity really was the only really time that I remember us taking them man for man. And look, we should have done much better, but we really failed to take our chances when it came to that. And that's the fine margins, right? Because you, you yeah. touched upon on earlier. Harland, Tony puts that in the back end there. And yeah. if that does go in the back of net, it's 2 0 for me. I think games yeah. wrapped up because not yeah. only 2 0 is a dangerous scoreline, but we would have knocked the stuffing out, stuffing out of Tottenham because it would have been a, an even game, two goals in quick succession. Because this was literally what five minutes after the first goal, if that. 
game over basically Spurs their, their heads are gone they're gonna have to start chasing the game then we actually fully can start picking them off there in what would have been the best possible situation but we don't man it's, and it's one of those things at the end of the day um now let's move forward into the David Raya save and this is a perfect screenshot absolutely fantastic say by David Raya and at this point right I'm, I obviously know it's, it's easy for me to say this because there's no footage of me but I genuinely I was watching the game with my family and I was saying I can sense Tottenham scoring before half time oh, because yeah. I talked about earlier on earlier on in the, in the video that Tottenham started to unlock that ball in behind especially to Kulusevski and then less so to Brendan Johnson and Son, but more of the top to Kulusevski and that route in behind and when I saw the plays developing I was thinking oh this could get very dangerous for us and they had a they had a good chance just before this that went that obviously they missed. And in this one by Brennan Johnson, I was sitting there thinking, this is a goal, it's in the back of net. But that drive with an absolutely superhuman stop, man. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, big keeper, big, big saves. Um, I think it, it came back from the space in behind Zinchenko as well. So <laughs> they they really applied the pressure in those last 10 minutes. Yeah. And what do you think about David Rye's overall game today? Because I'm a massive fan of David Rye and we big him yeah. up massively against yeah, PSG. Yeah. But I'll be honest, I don't think he had the greatest game today. That save was fantastic. Make no mistake about it. And I'm not going to sit here and say he had a he could have saved the first shot because he couldn't have. Yeah. I think he made a mistake in the build-up to the first goal. I'll be honest with it. Um, I think he should have definitely punched that further or catch it or clear it for a corner, if anything. And I think the second goal, he went down too easily because it's some basically passed in the back of net. But the main thing that really annoyed me about David Rye today was his distribution was absolutely terrible. Absolutely yeah. shocking, in my opinion. And that's one of the reasons that people said Arteta Ar Ar brought in David Rye for his distribution. I didn't see it today. He looked scruffy with the ball. He looked mm. like he was picking out a play a lot of times. He wasn't really being quick enough with possession, switching from left to right, even when receiving the ball. I don't think it was it was a good game from David Wright, to be honest. Would you agree? Yeah, I think it, you, you touched up on a good point. I think it's really David Wright today. He didn't have that much, that composure that you need in a top in mm. a big game like this. But I think it came down to look whenever he would play a diagonal ball, you're expecting touchline wingers to be there. I felt like if Martinelli was a touchline who was there as a touchline winger, his diagonal balls would have fed right into him. There were a couple of plays that he would pay right into diagonal and he's looking over and he's putting his hands up because, you know, either Zinchenko or Jesus are not in the spaces that were needed to occupy. He, his, his accurate passing is 66% today and it wasn't as good as what it would normally be. He mm. played a lot of long balls. He played 16 and only six came off that were accurate. And mm. I blame... The, it's easy to say, but I blame the Inketia for not holding up play. I think if we had Jesus, maybe you know David Raya's job would have looked much easier. I think he played the balls that were necessary at the certain times that were necessary, but at times you know we felt like a bit of composure is needed. Yeah, no, I I agree. I'd, look, I'm not saying it's fully down David Raya. I do agree that if you have a, a unit up there like an Ivan Tony or Haaland, that yeah. completion rate shoots up. But at the yeah. same time, I do think that you look at it and go David Raya, bro. Like certain times. You, I spoke about how Spurs had a lot of possession in their own half. And although they weren't dangerous, at least they were keeping the ball. We yeah. felt like we only had possession in their half. And that, that might sound positive, me saying that. But anyone that watched the game would know that we were wasteful. Like, we, we weren't really doing anything with the possession. And yeah. at the back, it felt like we, we weren't actually having much possession either. We weren't having any sort of control over the game. Yeah. It starts in phases, right? It's like whenever, yeah. whenever anyone says, go away from home, first 10 minutes, just hold the ball a little bit. Dumb, uh, like, die, uh, let their away uh, home fans die down a little bit. Let the, let the crowd simmer down, have control of football, everyone feel, have a feel of the ball so everyone's comfortable and then build from there. We feel like we didn't do that and we allowed Tottenham too much of that in my eyes. And this is where the first goal comes from. So, poor ball watching leads to Spurs' first goal. Now, this screenshot right here, you've got three players surrounding oh. Hoon Son right here, right? Yeah. And he still gets a shot away. And I'm sure I'm going to let you analyse the goal from start to finish. It was an absolute calamity of errors in my eyes from, from when the ball first got whipped in in the first place. No, I think even before, <laughs> from when Saka, you know, got dispossessed by Madison and he was just watch ball watching. I think everyone's job in this goal was poor. You know, mm. you had Ben White in a bad position. You had Saliba ball watching, Gabriel ball watching. I saw, you know, why, why are three different players occupying the same space? Why is nobody pressing? Why is nobody... Everyone's expecting a foul, but, you know, nothing is happening. I just felt like we caught ourselves cold for this goal and they have twice and you cannot allow for that to happen in a big game when, you know, high stakes, you want to push for the league, this type of, you know, ball watching, you know, putting your arms out, it's not going to help you here. I it's agree. And 
Yeah. And I'm going to make a point here, and this might be very harsh on Zinchenko, right? And I've, but I've seen this type of shot go in so many times. And I'm sitting there thinking, if you're Zinchenko, right? I, obviously, this picture's not exposed, so I can't see the, the back side of it. If I was Zinchenko as a left-back, and I'm seeing this develop with Madison going in, I would make, if there's no one on my back post making a run towards me or Fabio Vieira can't pick me up, I would dart to that, to that uh, back post. Because mm -hmm. how many times do we see a ball go near post and the striker flashes it far post? He doesn't power it in. He just passes it into the bottom corner. Now, this is very harsh on Zinchenko. Make no mistake about it. He's not the only defender that doesn't do this. But I'm sitting there thinking at one point, you can, if you're defending, you, I see the danger there. I would make a dash that far post to try and, to try and block it off. Now, obviously, very harsh point on Zinchenko. I'm not blaming him one bit for the goal. But I've, I've seen chances like that develop where the players are just sitting there thinking, oh, ball's gone back post. And the keeper's yeah. done his job. I'm not, I'm not blaming David Wright. He can't cover that far post. I'd rather him cover the near post than the far post. So sometimes you've got to think and go, look, three players got that player. You've got, uh, what's it called, Brennan Johnson there as well. If there's no one that's on your backside, you've got to go in there and try and highlight the danger, identify where the problem is. And it's that far post. Go and try and, like, there. Yeah, maybe it's a little bit harsh, man, but mm. I'm just trying to account for all, all players that had a role in the goal. Um, so yes, obviously we had the penalty. I guess we should talk about the penalty. Did you think it was a penalty in your eyes? Yeah, I think it was. I think his hand was in an unnatural position. I didn't even bother to put it in only because I just felt like it was just too. It was easy, you know. Can't analyze a penalty kick, but um, yeah, I think it was a penalty. His hand, his hand or arm was in an unnatural position, and you know, it just extended. It would have been a goal otherwise. So I think it's just simple as that. I agree with you. I've seen some uproar on Twitter saying it's not a penalty. I think it's Gary Neville in, in commentary for Sky Sports saying, saying it shouldn't be a penalty, but it's going to get given because of the rules. In my eyes, for A, softer penalty has been given. B, yeah. I think that's a clear-cut penalty, even if the rules don't change. His hand, look, I understand it's unnatural position, natural position argument. Ben White is about a metre from the goal, if that. Romero's hand is up here, A. Yeah. B, he actually makes a movement towards the ball. If he's pulling his hand away, I'd understand the argument. But he actually moves towards the ball. So as the ball's moving, his hand moves forward and collides with the ball. The ball is on a trajectory towards the goal. For yeah. me, I think that's a penalty. I don't see how anyone can debate that at yeah. all. So I don't understand. Maybe it's maybe it came off the back of Gary Neville making his, his points during commentary saying that, oh, it's going to get given, but it shouldn't be a penalty. The rules are a little bit, you know what I mean? Like that. But yeah. I think that's a stone penalty. I'm not, I'm not just even saying that as an Arsenal fan because yeah. I've said, I've said I've, I've, I've been as unbiased as possible saying other, other situations. But one thing I will say at the back of that penalty is, and I want to hear your opinion on this as well, Rami. Yeah. We scored that penalty for Saka, which was a great penalty, by the way, right down the middle. He goes to celebrate with the, with the fans. And I understand it's North London derby, but... When Declan Wright did it, it made sense. It was the 97th minute. At the time, I'm not even just saying this because we can see it two minutes later. I promise you, hand on heart, at the time, I turned to my dad and I go, why has he done that? Like, it, it, I look at the clock, I'm thinking, bloody hell, there's, there's 40 minutes plus added time to go. Okay. <laughs> he celebrated like it's, an, it's the last kick of the game. I'm thinking, yeah, boys, yeah. Like, heads. Yeah. Like, what, what do you think of that? I don't know. It's a mentality thing, really. And I think that's what court's called. <laughs> it's funny, it's easy to say as well. But um, yeah, I mean, for me, I would just say that you really need to just pick the ball up and just say, you know, reunite. I think we've had moments last season where that didn't happen and, like, oh, God, bring the team in and keep the mentality. I think this is where Granite Xhaka, yeah. Granite Xhaka would have kept the cool around because mm -hmm. we lacked experience in that point to just say, calma, keep it going. You know, there's a lot of time. Just keep our heads in the game. And that's what happened. I mean, he caught us off cold, you know, with the uh, laps in the concentration with the, yeah. Couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it when I watched it. Yeah, I agree with you. I think look, Saka scores that penalty is 2-1 after about 52, 53 minutes. That's when you you have your celebration and then you, you have your little team huddle you do, and everyone goes back to the penalty spot. Because yeah. what, what happened? Sorry, not penalty spot, the, the halfway line spot, right? Because we understand is right, that situation, the game was in the balance. We obviously looked a little bit shaky. We came out the second half looking really good, despite the fact that Declan Rice came off the pitch alongside Vieira. We yeah. scored that goal. That's the point where you regroup and understand, guys, we put this game to the sword. Last year against Tottenham, it was 1-1. We made it 2-1. The same time, for a mistake from Lloris around Gabriel Jesus, we weren't running into the crowd. We had our celebration. We go back to the halfway line spot. We carry on going. They get red card. We make the game 3-1. Yeah. On this occasion, this year, we're 2-1 up. Same time, same position. We go back down to 2-2. Now, obviously, I'm not saying that celebration led to Jorginho making a mistake. Yeah. Absolutely not. That's very far-fetched. But it does psychologically affect you, I think, where you run into the crowd. It, 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 the celebration looked like a game-winning celebration. I think psychologically, it can make you feel like the job is done yeah. when, you, when, when you do that. Now, I'm not anti-celebration whatsoever. Not, not by any stretch of imagination. I'm, I'm all for it, man. I will never be the celebration police. But I think at that time in the game, it wasn't the right move. It felt a little bit displaced and it didn't feel mm -hmm. like it, was, it, it matched the flow of the game and the vibe of the game at that moment. 
But let's move on to the goal that you've highlighted here, right? Lapse in concentration. Now, Jorginho obviously makes the mistake. I don't know what he was doing, to be honest. God, yeah. I think NFL sacked was how um, Peter Drury described it. Maybe a perfect <laughs> perfect way to describe it. Then yeah. obviously, just clinical for Madison and, and yeah. Son. Do you blame Gabriel in this situation? Because, I mean, I, I was shouting, engage the man, engage the man, because I was just waiting for yeah. Obviously, everyone knew Madison was going to make the pass to Son. But I was thinking, you know what? Just engage the man. By that time, hopefully, oh, it was Saliba. Sorry, I don't think I don't think it was Gabriel. Yes, I, can't remember, I can't remember who it was, but yeah. he was like one on one. Do you do you blame him for the situation, or do you think it's just one of those things? Look, I mean, a two v is it? It was really a two v one, and yeah. you just feel like in those situations, it's in the it's in the favor statistically or of eye test or whatever you want to call it. It's in the favor of the attackers at that point, and you know he can only do as much as he can. He can anticipate. He can put his body position and whatever, but more times out of 10, you know, nine times out of 10, the attacker's going to score <laughs> in a chance like this. And it would take something incredible out of, you know, out of the blue. But you shouldn't even put yourself in the first place in a situation like this. And that's what I would say. So I wouldn't really blame the defenders. It's a, it's a shape that we set up in a kickoff. So it's something that, you know, we, we can't prevent, but you prevent by not, <laughs> not getting dispossessed in the first 10 seconds of a kickoff, you know. Yeah, I agree with you 100% in that respect as well. And also the second point is, Jorginho loses the ball, fine. You foul him in that situation, man. As soon as... Jorginho's a smart enough man. He's, yeah, he's yeah, very yeah. smart than me in terms of football terms. He's around, what, 33 years old now? You identify the danger. You see it's your two most dangerous opposition players, Son and Madison, the two players that have been on form this season for them. You see the way it's developing. I You foul him in that situation. I don't know if you tried to foul him and he wasn't quick enough. I don't know, but you've got to tell us tactical fouls, man. We see Pep's team do that all the time, tactical fouls. You've got a, a, a tactical foul in my eyes right there. Bring him down, take the yellow card, eat your medicine. We don't concede the goal, man. Every Arsenal fan would have taken that. Yeah. But it's one of those things, man. Hindsight is 2020 uh, 20 at the end of the day. Um, so now let's move on to some of the uh, the other yeah. stats here. So field tilt. This is a new one for me. I don't see a lot of this. So what is what does this represent? Field field tilt. It just it just shares the so it says at the bottom too, but it's really what the number of touches you have in the opposing you know final third. So it really just shows. It's a good indicator of dominance and threat. That's how I like to see it. And it just uses, you know, like it averages 10 minutes as just a, as a, like a moving average over the game, over the, over, the halos, over the first half. But this is my point. And I wanted to make this point really clear. This is where you tuck games away in the first half. And this is why, because we had the majority of, you know, the yeah. threat. And look, look at how the chance that we took. We took it in the bang middle of the game in the first half, in like, what, the 27th minute, whatever it was. Mm. But Tottenham, as soon as they get their threat, they tuck away. And this showed the balance of game that we had. It was an open, again, I say open, expansive game where both teams were, you know, back and forth, but we failed to capitalise on the chances that we had. And on the other hand, Tottenham were able to capitalise on their chances that they had. So that is what really the field tilt really shows here. Wow. So that's really interesting. So this is the first half build tilt, is what you're yeah. saying, right? Yeah, that's wow. So, I mean, it didn't it didn't feel this dominant in the game for me. I can't lie, but yeah, if you look yeah. at it from this respect, it, it does look that way. And I do look at the first half and think we we were getting the ball in good areas. We just weren't really creating any clear cut chances from yeah. it. Look at exactly. Jesus one that like, he should have tucked away definitely. Um, but yeah, that's a really interesting point. And to be fair, it does the the, the last like whatever ten minutes of the sec, uh, first half, including the added time, probably does represent what I expected because yeah. Tottenham really started to turn it on yeah. uh, exactly. in that in that uh, end of the first half and the second half, etc. Um, so it's a new one as well. So high turnovers. So what's it? What's uh, lead us through this, Rami? Okay, so this is in the opposing team top. So on the left is the Arsenal, and on the right is Spurs. So this is where you know when Spurs trying to build that from the left, they mm. press and turn over and get a shot. So we had a, a lot of turnovers. Which, you know, represents that we pressed a lot, but we didn't press enough, which led to enough good chances. So we pressed, you know, turn over eleven times. We were able to recoup the ball. 11 times in the final third and it only led to two shots so you almost say all of that work for what <laughs> did it lead to anything good it only led to two shots but on the other hand tottenham five turnovers represents that you know we're able more comfortable like i said more comfortable to build out the back or comfortable in the, in those defensive transitions and they got one shot so you know it seems like we should have taken better control and had better you know opportunities from the from our turnovers and it, yeah I guess it just wasn't enough for us and I think both chances were the Inketia chance and the Jesus chance those yeah. were the shots that led to the turnovers so you know it says a lot really from what from what happened in the uh, in the game 
Yeah, and that point you made right at the end was exactly what I was just about to talk about. And those yeah. both two chances were the Jesus one and the Enketia one. Enketia should have, I, in my opinion, squared it to Vieira, but that's that's neither here nor there. And the reason I was going to make that point is because this worries this worries me actually looking at this because yes, we're getting the ball off their turnovers, which is it's a high risk, high reward system, right? Playing out the back, but you take away the Jesus chance, you take away the Enketia chance. What other chance did we really have in this game? You can think about the Jesus one at the start where Vic Vicario made a save. But I wouldn't call that a clear cut chance. It was an okay chance, but it wasn't a clear cut chance. Other than that, the only chance we really generated from this game were the goals and these two chances right here, which were off Tottenham errors. Yeah. So you got to sit there and think, what did we really do in a 90-minute football game, 95, 100-minute football game, if you include at a time, when you've got players like Erdgaard on the pitch, you've got players like Vieira, Saka on the pitch. What did we really do? And that, that's the most worrying part because we've lost certain games and we've won certain games and we've drawn games. And I've not been too distraught with the team. The reason I'm so annoyed today, right, is because I watched an Arsenal team that looked far from their best, far from their best. Now, yes, we can account injuries into this, but... I genuinely think we played Tottenham on any other week. We, we beat them. Yeah. Like, any other week. We, man for man, we've got a better football team than Tottenham. We've got better players than Tottenham. But you look around the pitch, right? Man for man, Tottenham outplayed us today. Madison was better than Odegaard on the pitch today. Bissouma was better than Rice on the pitch today. Fair enough, Rice got injured, so I'll take that one out of the equation. But he was better than Rice slash uh, Jorginho in there. Kulisevsky, I think, played better than Jesus on that uh, right-hand side. Son was clearly better than Nketi because he got two goals. So, man for man... Spurs were out playing us on the pitch and that's the most worrying sign because we just did not match up for them well and I guess it's one of those things Artis got to take a hard long look in the mirror about that because it's his team selection his tactics and he got I guess in that second half outplayed yeah and player the match so it is a bit this is a bit of a um a salty one from us man because <laughs> we've given it to Bukaya Saka wouldn't say that he's played yeah, the match overall I would personally give it to either Son or Madison uh if I'm honest yeah. But you didn't expect Kai Saka for his right. Did he? Did he? Did he get the first goal, or did he go down as an own goal? He got. He went down as an own goal. So, so oh, he yeah. only got one goal in the match then, technically. Uh, but yeah, talk us through Bukai Saka's performance today. Yeah, I mean, he was really like I said, the only really outlet of threat all game. Like I, we didn't really have a threat going down the left hand side too much or down the middle. Um, so it was really his one v one, his link up play that really created any threat for us all game. Mm. Uh, yeah, so that's that is really the only reason why I gave him the player of the match. It was just based on the fact that he got us our two goals, and he really created the really clearer cut chances. But yeah, I mean, it's not something I would say. Okay, Bakai Saka was heads and tails above everybody else. It was, it's a team collective performance, and it's something that I think Arteta needs to decide as to what he does in a situation he has injuries like this. What type of system does he really revert to? What does he play? Does he stick with what he does? If he sticks with what he does, and you have the personnel available to you, be it with, the, with their experience or without their experience, you should trust in the hell end products if you're going to keep them on the bench. And yeah, so that is really my, my last point <laughs> when it comes yeah. to this. No, I agree with you 100% in that respect as well. And yeah, I don't think Zach had the, the greatest game, but he was the danger man out there at the end of the day, and, and two goals came from him. So you got yeah. respect then for that. But overall, that concludes our tactical analysis of the game today between Arsenal and Tottenham Hotspur. It finished 2-2. Not the greatest result. I don't think either of us are happy with the result at the end of the day, but I don't believe, well, I guess we don't, both don't believe that the performance warranted any more, to be completely honest. But we'll be back hopefully next week. I don't think we'll be able to do one in midweek for the Carabao Cup, but it's only a Carabao Cup game, so it's not the end of the world. We'll try and get one out. But regardless, we'll be back next week for the next Arsenal game, which is against Bournemouth in the Premier League. So hopefully, back with a bounce and uh, back with a bang, sorry. And I can say back to winning ways again. I need, I need my, my streak to come back. Yeah. <laughs> we need the streak to come back. But I appreciate everyone that's tuning in today. As always, check out Rami's socials at Stats Optic on Twitter. And I keep calling it Twitter on X and on, on Instagram. Um, he drops live, well, he drops, he drops literally player analysis, player by player of the majority of, of the big games out there. Make sure you check it out, man. It's brilliant stats coming out there. XG, their shots on target, really eye opening. Um, so, yeah, I appreciate everyone that tuned in. As always, let us know your thoughts in the comment section. And if you are new around here, make sure you do subscribe on the road to 5,000 subscribers. I'm Wifey Boy. I appreciate you guys all for tuning in. And I hope to catch you all in my next one.